This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Well, it's Homelessness Week, Emerald. Favourite week of the year. (laughs) Happy Homelessness Week, everybody. Happy Homelessness Week, yeah. It gets earlier every year. It gets more and more commercialised. Don't forget the real meaning of Homelessness Week. The ABC celebrated with an article entitled Landlord's Frustration at Bad Tenants as Industry Warns Against Rental Caps and Freezers. Okay. Now, would you be shocked to learn, Emerald, that this landlord in question being profiled is in fact a Greens voter? (gasps) What? Tell me more. What else is she? Well, she's a lifelong Greens voter. Her name is Sandy Dennis. And she's an environmentalist. But 30 years as a landlord, 10 of those in Perth, have left her conflicted between the Greens tenants of giving renters a fair go in sustainable quality housing and being burnt by another bad tenant. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, Sandy. I mean, those are just two two competing things. You had a bad experience with some tenants, but then should... You know, so should we really give people a fair go and give them housing as a yeah. basic human right? So, because the idea, like, the idea here, is it that tenants have been naughty and so we shouldn't reward them because if we reward them, they'll just be more naughty or something. We yes. need to punish them for being naughty. Or is it somehow that, like, by introducing rent caps and freezers, which have nothing to do with how a tenant treats a property, then that will make the tenant treat the, pop- the property worse? I don't know. I'm, what's the argument here? Maybe you're going to tell me. Tell me. What's the article say? I think gen- Sandy's general vibe is, well, you know, we shouldn't do nice things for tenants because I've had this, these bad individual experiences. Therefore, all tenants mm. should be treated with suspicion and shouldn't be given any more treats, <laughs> like regulation of the uh, profiteering vampiric rental um, yeah. market. Yeah. That's being nice to renters, like, to be clear, is still just making them pay your mortgage. But, yes. but anyway, go on. Uh, she said five tenants, she's gone through, she's gone through five tenants in the past 10 years. All but one, she said, had either skipped rent, run a methamphetamine kitchen. Okay. I mean, um, okay. <laughs> I mean, sounds pretty, again, if you're a real green supporter, you would support small businesses and a, <laughs> uh, a better approach to the drug industry. Okay, Sandy, so. Fucking read the policy platform mm. is my is my argument. Mm-hmm. Failed to clean the house or left it oh, damaged. Grime in the oven. <laughs> I had one lady who left the house immaculate and she was a wonderful tenant but had to go to Queensland. Oh, <laughs> Where all the wonderful no. tenants live, so I hear. <laughs> Hello. How's it going, by the way? Have you had any luck? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, no. I, I am considering buying, actually, and joining your, your class oh, um, yes. just so I don't get fucking kicked out again. But. We'll see. TBC. All the others have taken off, done a midnight blitz, she said. Listen to this. I won't take anyone who was on social security anymore, and I feel bad about that. But four of my tenants As have been on social should, security. You ghoul. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Okay, go on. Four of my tenants have been on social security for one reason or another. They have all been the ones who have taken off on me. Um, oh, Sandy. Oh, dear. Okay. Right, I'm looking at it now and this next bit is um, I, I start to paint a picture in my head of Sandy Dennis because she said she's given up on pop- property managers to run her investment property and tried to avoid lengthy delays in court to get bonds back. Mm-hmm. She said she managed the rental property herself and ignored yeah. reference letters and phone calls when vetting a prospective tenant. Um, so she's like what the, do- the worst of the worst kind of landlord, dodgy, like, is like, no, nah, no agents um, would probably not do shit for the property, wants to get around all of the actual, like the very few kind of mechanisms in place to protect, you know, renters as well as landlords in a way. Loves a pop-in, I reckon, Sandy. I reckon she's a landlord who loves, loves the pop-by, pop the drop-by. Mm. It just sort of has a look around and going, oh, you're keeping it tidy? You're not on job seeker, are you, by any chance? Are you, I can yeah. smell it on you. Are you. What are you doing? She, she then says, she then says that um, she will go and see them in person to see it's a real person, Brilliant. and I'll ask for proof that they've paid their light bills. What is a light bill? And have a work history. Mm. I'm usually a very trustful yeah. person, <laughs> Miss Dennis said. Oh, Miss Dennis, you're coming across as a real psycho. I hate to break it to you. You really are. You're a ghoul and a psycho. The pause turned me into an <laughs> asshole, apparently. But then yeah. look, this is this slide from the ABC article. 
Hers is the other side of Australia's housing crisis that recorded 122,000 people as homeless in the 2021 census. What the fuck are you talking? The other side of the they crisis? To, because, what are you talking about? Because they wrote the article and they sent it to the editor and the editor's like, oh, we should put something in. Sandy, please. Vote vote, vote your heart. Vote for the Liberal Party. Don't worry yeah. about it. We'll do without your vote. We won't we'll miss survive. you. Don't worry. Sell your investment property or just or donate it to charity or something. For the love of God, please. Mm. For your own good. Sounds like it's really causing you a lot of stress. <laughs> yeah, get out of the market. Like twenty yeah. percent of other landlords across That's Victoria awful. who are finding you it should, so um, difficult leave. to provide basic decent housing uh, to people, and I say provide, mm. I mean you know, for a fee, uh, that they're mm. selling up and getting out, and um, those properties are going to people who only who do have no houses. You guys have got more than one house. These people have no houses, mm. so it's actually working out. Yeah, great. but they are dull bludgers. So, yes. you know. Um. This is the same c- that spent half a podcast laughing along, joining in, calling Anthony Abadez, you stupid cut. But you can't just throw money at a problem and make it good. If you could, Tom Ballard would still have a show. That's your brain on greens. We're stuck with the hosts of Chapo Shithouse podcast. This is, this is, this is a serious danger to Australia. Well, it's a serious danger, everybody. It's a podcast about green politics in Australia. It's not an official Greens Party podcast. I'm Tom Ballard. That's Emerald Moon. Hey. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, This is made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael Griffin. This week, we're looking at the latest news on The Voice to Parliament, a little bit of kerfuffle around treaty, and we're going to be joined by climate activist Jesse Noakes from Disrupt Bureau Hub to learn more Mm -hmm. about the state of climate protesting in WA. Jesse's been getting in trouble out west Uh, in recent times. uh, The state is cracking down, even though, you know, Jesse's just trying to stop people cooking the planet and killing us all. So we're going well, to find out what's going on there. Jesse's an extremist, as we'll learn. Oh, is um, Speaking of extremists, we'd like to welcome our new patrons. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah, Thomas, Justin, who's back again. Now, yep. Justin did explain that they, <laughs> they have investigated the technical issue that caused them to become a patron so many times, and it's sorted now, but welcome, Justin. Um, and Nicola. Thanks, everyone. We hope that you enjoy the latest chat that we just put out with um, Lee Rhiannon. Tom and Lee Rhiannon, I was really jealous to not be part of this special interview, but Tom wanted Lee all to himself, which is quite selfish of him. (laughs) Pretty fucked up. Uh, It was a great (laughs) chat and we put it out on the Patreon this week. We talked about her life since leaving Parliament, her work in fighting for human rights in India and Palestine. I learned a lot about India actually talking about too, Lee Rhiannon, and Mm. if you've wondered about what's going on with all that politics with Narendra Modi and stuff, Mm. really good discussion. And we talked about what she makes of the Greens these days and what she thinks the party's doing well, what she thinks the party could do a lot better at. Uh, Really good discussion with former New South Wales Green Senator Lee Rhiannon. Uh, quick plug too. We mentioned it before, but the Green Institute conference is on next weekend at the same time as the Labor conference in Canberra. The Green oh, Institute is holding its scheduling, chess conference. Scheduling conflict. Oh, big big conflict. <laughs> Pulling them in. Uh, yes, fighting for the same uh, attendees. I'm sure <laughs> it's entitled "The City Transformed: Urban Life at the End of the World as We Know It." Uh, of course, we've mentioned before about you know tickets are a little bit pricey in some respects, Spin-off. but it's all priced just to cover basic costs. And also you can buy online tickets too. I didn't really realise this. You don't have to physically be there. You can actually go online. They're relatively cheap yeah. and you can watch sessions online. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes for the Institute if you want to buy tickets to that conference. There are bursaries as well. If you can't afford oh, yeah. to pay for a ticket, um, you can ask for a bursary. And I understand there are a few left, so that's something to investigate. Do it. Uh, let's have another vibe check on the voice to parliament debate. We've had a few little wrinkles and progress over the past couple of weeks. There was the Gama Festival last weekend, which was a big platform for a lot of people supporting the voice to parliament. Although polling's still not doing great, we're sort of falling support across the board, across multiple polls now, like it seems to be something of a trend. We're still a fair way away. Still a few open questions. Any updates on your front, Emerald? Has the voice been entering your political consciousness? Have people been talking about it? It is still all quiet on the northern front for (laughs) The Voice. Like I think that I am aware because I work in politics that there Mm. are, yes, groups forming. Again, they are mostly just Labor trying to get something happening in Queensland and sadly it's, uh, 
it's a bit sad. It's a bit bit sad and small. So over the past two weeks, this is a lot of this sort of stuff went down last week, but I thought it was worth um, checking in on. A uh, little bit of an extra complication. The thorny question of treaty was thrown into and brought up in relation to the debate when it comes to the voice to parliament. Yeah. Very basic overview here. Um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart calls for voice, treaty and truth. Specifically, it reads, we seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. Mm -hmm. Makarata is a Yonu word. It means to come together after a struggle. I, I was reading it literally means like the piercing of someone's leg with a spear, right? Like oh. when someone fucked up. They would pe literally pierce their leg that. with a spear. That was sort of called makarata. It then sits to come to mean generally, you know, resolving conflict, coming together okay. after bad shit has gone down. Okay. So, yeah. So last week there were reports about a slightly strengthened wording in the draft Labor platform in regards to the party's policy on treaty. This is the kind of stuff that might be ratified at the Labor conference next weekend. This is from the City Morning Herald. Strengthened wording in the unpublished draft of Labor's national platform, which guides Labor's election agenda, states, Labor will take steps to implement all three elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in this term of government. Labor sources said the wording, developed through consultation with senior party figures, including ministerial officers, was ambiguous on timing. If ratified at the party's conference, the platform could endorse any moves by the Albanese government to start a treaty process before the next election, although it does not compel it to do so. Wow. <laughs> so pretty strong stuff. Thanks, Labor. Thank you, Labor. What was your understanding of Labor's position on treaty before this? Does this change anything? Or like, what, what do you generally think about when you think about the Labor Party and the idea of a treaty? Well, I thought that they had committed money towards treaty. I thought that that was part of the negotiations that the Greens secured in exchange for us supporting the passage of the referendum legislation in Parliament. Am I wrong? Well, no, you're absolutely correct, which makes it okay. all weirder. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the point of this position, I mean, I mean, again, it's very ambiguous and very noncommittal and very basic, but I suppose the, the only slight move is to try and say, that the treaty process would happen in this term of government, maybe, but then I guess they don't even have to do that. So it's all very odd. Yeah. Okay. Great. But that story prompted Peter Dutton, the coalition, the broader no campaign to start shitting their pants, at least performatively, and whip up some racist fear mongering. So, you know, they, again, we know the no campaign is trying to bring in almost any other question they possibly can. So any level of doubt, any kind of fear or, um, you know, bad faith questions they can bring up about the voice with any element at all. So, We've done it mm. with lots of other subjects, but now they're saying, oh, this means treaty, and so uh, treaty is what's going to happen. So they They're going to take your house kind of thing. Classic. Yeah, sure. Right, okay. At the same time, and Albanese and the Labor government did a very shit job of actually defending what they actually believe and staring that down and trying to be sort of too clever by half. Because so was, they don't know. They don't know. They don't actually know. Um, they were hammering it in Parliament. Dutton said the questions surrounding a treaty go to the Prime Minister's credibility and pointed out Albanese had said repeatedly in a radio interview two weeks ago that the voice isn't about a treaty, despite committing on election night to implement the Uluru Statement in full, which is voice, treaty, truth. I mean, um, to be fair, the voice isn't about a treaty, though. That's true. Y yes, the voice isn't about a treaty. Yes, that is true. I suppose you could say, well, the idea of the voice has come from the Uluru State from the heart, which also calls for treaty. So I guess, yes, technically the voice, this referendum isn't about a treaty necessarily, but there is a relationship there, I suppose. And, I, and okay. what we see here is Albany is trying to distance himself from the whole concept of treaty. He's going, why are you talking about treaty? It's completely irrelevant to the conversation. He's going, well, that's not yeah. quite true necessarily. Yeah, I mean, both arguments sound wrong to me, but hey, who am I? <laughs> who are you? Just a podcaster. Um, <laughs> Michaela Cash and David Littleproud were pointing to new cultural heritage laws in WA as examples of how a voice or a treaty would infringe on white people's precious, precious property rights. So, yes, as you say, in the 90s when native title legislation was kicking around, it was black people are coming to your backyard mm. and they're going to claim any land that they point at and take it away. They probably should be able to do that, but that's not yep. what the native title <laughs> legislation was about. But it's absolutely not. Yep. We also then had an amazing piece from the Daily Mail, uh, obviously dropped or brought As to always. attention by <laughs> fuckheads in the, in the No campaign, um, a letter and a photo emerging. Albo's decades-long push for a treaty revealed. Anthony Albanese signed a letter demanding reparations in 1986. Oh, and this is a wonderfully, 
wonderful example of Albanese doing something cool when he was young and left wing mm. and now needing to distance himself from it. There, there cannot be any suggestion that he's in any way cool mm. or based and he will distance himself from these accusations. It's very important. Mm-hmm. It's a, I mean, yes, that uh, that when we did the episode where we did the Q&A, maybe this was on Patreon, but we were talking about that song, Love Me, I'm a Liberal, and yeah. the best line in that song surely is, but I've grown older and wiser and that's why I'm turning you in. Oh, God. Even went to socialist meetings. Learned all the old union hymns Ah, but I've grown older and wiser And that's why I'm turning you in So love me, love me, love me I'm a liberal That's just so fucking Labor MPs. The Labor. Anthony Albanese has supported a treaty with Aboriginal Australians for nearly four decades. It has been revealed, love that, as an open letter he signed in 1986, which outlined a demand for reparations resurfaces. Wow, just resurfaces. Just incredible. Mm, That's crazy. The then 23-year-old left-wing activist signed the open letter to the National Times dated April 18th, 1986, with Indigenous leaders Pat Dodson and Marsha Langton. The letter supported the granting of land rights and appropriate compensation for the invasion of Aboriginal land. It called for recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty, land rights, and compensation for lands lost and for social and cultural disruption, which is just so, like, it's not even like a radical, you know, burn the system down, set fire to the flag, fuck capitalism, revolution comrades. It's like the most mild, reasonable calls if you have any interest in actually correcting the historical record and the legacy of invasion and colonisation. But I, and so I'm sure, you know, Anthony Albanese was at great pains to defend that. No. No, oh, he wow. was not. He His response to the letter thing was like, that was ages ago. That was before native title legislation, basically. Oh, we and fixed it. Yeah, we fixed we it fixed all, it I guess, now. Title. And he probably yeah. said he's 23. The Daily Matic article also had a photo of him at a Midnight Oil concert wearing a T-shirt that says Voice Treaty Truth because Midnight Oil's released like a, a collection of songs based around the Uluru Statement from the Heart as well, and that was the yeah. um, T-shirt. The caption on the Daily Mail website says, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese rocked out at the Midnight Oil Farewell gig <laughs> wearing the band's Voice Treaty Truth T-shirt at Sydney's Horton Pavilion. It was a band T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Can we? Uh, I feel like this is the kind of thing that we should put. Um, we'll, we'll put a post up on the the Serious Danger Instagram including a slideshow with this this classic picture and the caption. Yeah. Look at him rocking out there. He looks so angry. He's rocking out. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese rocked out. The crime of rocking out. So I charge you. <laughs> Being too based. <laughs> so obviously the attacks from Dutton and the No campaign are all terrible. The Daily Mail sucks, yada, yada, yada. But as I say, the response for Albert Easy to it was pretty pretty lackluster and shit. He did this car crash interview on RN Breakfast with Patricia Carvelis last week. Really, I would argue Anthony Albanese not enjoying the ending of the honeymoon period, okay? Really tetchy, mm-hmm. really short, being challenged on any front. Patricia Carvelis, you know, can sometimes be a aggressive interviewer but, you know, gives people a, a decent chance to express their opinion. Not a not – a, um, hostile environment of the ABC for Anthony Albanese by any stretch of the imagination, but any challenge or any extra question whatsoever responded very testily. Um, yeah. Could not, he did not admit there was also, they also talked about housing during that interview, would not admit that we're in a housing crisis, by the way. It was just sort of saying mm-hmm. housing is kind of bad, but we're doing heaps of stuff. Just, she was like, Do, are we in a housing crisis? And he would not give a straight answer. He wouldn't. Wow. That's, um, that just makes you come across as stupid. Like, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Don't you think increasingly, I don't know if I'm just being dramatic or if this is just what politicians and particularly male politicians are like, but I increasingly get that kind of aggressive, like tetchy, on edge, almost like Kevin Rudd vibes yes. from Anthony Albanese. How dare you? You feel like he's just going to snap. Yes. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, he just seems irritated. And uh, actually, Anastasia Palaszczuk has a similar thing that she just comes across as really irritated whenever she faces any kind of scrutiny or questioning, particularly from journalists. And, yeah, I don't know how they get away with it, to be honest, but, yeah. It just got really, like, 
Patricia Carvel, her job is to say, like, look, the No campaign and Peter Dutton are saying this. They're asking questions about that treaty. Mm. What is your position on treaty? Like, really softball mm-hmm. stuff. Like, what is your position on treaty? Yeah, um, give us your line. You, You've got yes. a prepared line on this, surely. Go for it. So, Don't get angry at me for asking the question. Like, what the hell yeah. are you doing? When asked if a treaty would be pursued this term if the voice referendum succeeded, he said no because that's occurring with the states right now. He says treaties are already happening at the state level, Victoria, Queensland, yeah. Northern Territory. Okay. Um, but, but he was really yeah. stuck on this point. Are you still committed to you Commonwealth negotiating Patricia. treaties? Patricia, Patricia, well, well, where does it say that? It doesn't even say that in the Uluru Statement from the heart. It well, doesn't say that. It doesn't speak about the Commonwealth negotiating treaties. It doesn't say that, Patricia. So don't get sucked into... Oh, I'm not sucked into uh, anything. I just is. want to know what your position is. So what do we think about this? He loves saying things aren't his job, doesn't he? He doesn't hold a hose. <laughs> he doesn't He doesn't negotiate a treaty. <laughs> but, it, but you know, yeah, like loves saying things aren't Commonwealth responsibility. The states are doing it. Yes, it's all the states. Which people hate, by the way. Like no one cares. Like just – and they yeah. know that you're the Prime Minister, you're quite powerful. So, yes. So um, you'll be just fine. Yeah. But what do you think of that? When you think of treaty, when you when you say like we're going to mm. have a treaty, do you automatically think mm. it, it's at the Commonwealth level negotiated with the yeah. um, all the well, th- various First Nations or some kind of representative body like The Voice or are we talking about the state and territory level proceedings that, that are underway at the moment when it comes to treaty? Okay, so I'm not thinking about state and territory level, that's for sure. I think I am thinking about Commonwealth level and then I guess underneath that, though, I am thinking about very kind of um, community level, like small scale treaties with particular groups and over particular country, you know. But But I would imagine that, yeah, when you say treaty, you mean that that sits under an overarching agreement like with the current state, you know, with the colonial state. Right. Because my understanding is in the US where they do have treaties with First Nations people, they are overwhelmingly conducted at the state. I mean, yeah, there is no federal US treaty with the yeah, First Nations people but, across the country. They are all sort of um, state-based. But the US is weird. We shouldn't look at anything <laughs> that they do. And they have like a million states and I don't know. Touche. That's the kind of political analysis you get here at Serious Nature. <laughs> U.S. be weird. <laughs> now that we do U.S. political analysis, um, and this I Trump am an guy, expert. I don't know. He's kind of looks like it, a cheater. He seems kind of shitty to me. I don't know, guys. Okay, what about the strategy? Where I mean, like, I have a level of sympathy for Anthony Albanese trying to be like, I don't want to be dragged into a conversation about treaty at this point. I, I, I want to keep the focus on the voice. I don't want to play the no campaigns game. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I want to try and, you know, shut down this conversation and try and point this as a discussion because, you know, it's fair enough that Peter Dutton's questions here are not being you know, asked in good faith or what have you. Sure. But, I mean, he just sort of comes across as a bit dodgy and shifty and it is undermined and weak. all the reporting reflected this. As you mentioned before, the Labor government has committed $5.8 million towards the Macarata process. $900,000 of that has already been spent. It's all apparently being put on hold until after the referendum. But, you know, that is a level of commitment to a Commonwealth government role in overseeing agreement making and truth telling, which his own government has already committed to. And he regularly said that they commit to implementing the, the um, all three parts of the Uluru Statement. So what's what's he playing at here? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just weak, bad, like, and again, kind of, yeah, treating people like they're stupid and they can't understand more than one thing at once. Right. Or if he would, you know, boldly endorse or, or just back his, his very well-documented stated position that he believes in treaties um, and that he wants well, his government to play a role in that, at least this is what he said, um, that that's going to scare people off or something, that he can't just back his own vaguely progressive position and stare down those questions and say, yeah, you're damn right I believe in treaty. Like that's my party's position. It's Labor once again thinking that they can stop attacks against them right. like they think that they can yeah stop the lnp and the daily mail attacking them um for doing anything and they just can't and so like yeah they're like well okay well if we just because if i talk about treaty then they'll use that to attack us and it's like yeah and if you don't talk about treaty they'll use that to attack you yes because that's their job they're <laughs> going to attack you so stand up for what you fucking believe in i don't know how many times we have to have this conversation like we've said it so many times before but that it's again it's just that Errol, if we keep Doing this podcast, I think we're really going to have the conversation that Labor should set up for they believe it and be progressive. <laughs> so obvious. I'm tired. <laughs> this was so good. It's like in, in regards to the T-shirt, 
like he had a bit of fun with this and part mm. of it, he was laughing it off. And he said, who knew someone would wear a Midnight Oil T-shirt at a Midnight Oil concert? And it's just like, okay, the outrage about the T-shirt is stupid, but fuck, okay. that's not the fucking point. Like he's like, I, I was just wearing a T-shirt. I don't, I don't necessarily have a actually- position on the three big words that are on that T-shirt. I don't give a shit or endorse that. I was just wearing a T-shirt. Don't get angry at me. I mean, can we also interrogate how fucking lame it is to wear the T-shirt of the band <laughs> that you're at their gig? Because that is like, actually, if we are going to look at whether that is a normal thing to do, that's fucking lame. <laughs> What is this? You're going to wear this to the show. You're going to wear the shirt of the band you're going to go see. Don't be that guy. I mean, I understand a politician doing that, maybe. I once went to see the Vines and the lead singer was like, was wearing a Vines t-shirt. I think it's worse if the band is wearring the, their own merch. That's no, no that's fine. Oh, what? You've got so many of your own band's shirts. <laughs> I wore my band's shirt to the last podcast recording that we did. No, that's because you've got a lot of them. But in the gear, but not at the at the show. Yeah, nah, nah. It's no. It is way fucking weirder and and shitter to wear the (laughs) bed like as a as an audience member to be like, oh, gotta get out my midnight oil shirt for the show. Cute. Fair enough. All right. Well, I guess we have different angles on what he should be <laughs> prosecuted for. Let us know. One. I don't know. Like, but I, yes, I know in my community and in my heart, oh boy. Anthony Albanese is a fucking loser and this is just one more reason. <laughs> Brilliant. The other thing I want to ask you about is you know, this idea of reparations was brought up. So, again, another um, element of scaring campaign or some racist bullshit being brought up by the No campaign and by people who are opposed to such things as native title legislation or the voice, et cetera. The question of reparations is obviously wheeled out as a big culture war issue here and in the US as well. Mm. I don't know. What what do you think about reparations? Have you lent much thought to it? Do you see reparations playing a role in any kind of treaty negotiation that you imagined between Australia and its first peoples? I would say, like, I mean, you would kind of hope so, but I think it is true that it's a fairly nebulous idea. Like I, I haven't seen many very concrete or detailed proposals for what reparations would look like, where it would come from, who it would go to, what it would be used for, what that actually means, et cetera. Um, and, yeah, so it being such a vague idea means that it's it's even easier for the the right to use for the little scare campaigns, yeah. um, but it's certainly not unreasonable. Yeah. I mean, as you said, yes, I guess at least the concept of some compensation for the wrongs of the past being something to be negotiated at the treaty level is a perfectly reasonable position yeah. to take. But but, yeah. it's, but it is an easy one to whip up some fear about, right? It sounds like, what, everybody who identifies as Indigenous is going to get a check or whatever? Like these are the arguments that can be wheeled out um, to play in it. But to say that, yes, compensation paid for the crimes of the past to make lives better for First Nations people today and to recognise their ongoing sovereignty with their country in a meaningful way is a completely reasonable realm to discuss when we talk about treaty. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, just a few other quick updates on The Voice uh, over the past couple of weeks. The Yes campaign is saying their polling is still showing 35 to 40% of voters still haven't made up their mind, which I thought was kind of interesting. Could be them trying to spin the results of recent polling, but an interesting thing to keep in mind. The organisers of the S23 campaign claim to have an army of 20,000 volunteers out there working on the campaign, which is kind of interesting. The Business Council of Australia has covered board. I know you're very excited to know where the BCA stands on The Voice. Finally. Oh, so good. That's awesome. Business Council Chief Executive Jennifer Westacott said, we believe The Voice is the right mechanism to give Indigenous Australians a stronger say on legislation, policy and programs that directly impact their communities and their lives. We know that we get better results when we listen. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You know, when you're having conversations with your friends and family and people in your community and they're like, I don't know, like I am not quite decided on how to vote in this referendum yet. I just haven't really heard from the Business Council yeah, so yeah. I really, I'm really struggling, and and then we can now say, well, actually, Business Council Chief Executive Jennifer Westacott gets better results when she listens, and yep. so she's she's voting yes. So. Yeah, board. Of course, Woodside yeah. is on the Business Council of Australia too, and I'm sure that they will respect the will of the voice, oh, so even good. if the voice recommends anything that might cut into yeah, their profits. I'm sure yeah, be and I'm sure the no, Labor Party, please. which accepts donations from the uh, Woodside as well, will also listen to the voice uh, over any. Thoughts coming from the forces of capital at the head of Woodside. Yeah. Still vote yes, but, so you know. inspiring. Critical yes. Um, and last point, I, there's a big uh, hoo-ha, which was nothing, about the Gama Festival, massive cultural um, festival that happens every year of great significance for First Nations people held in the Northern Territory. Uh, Peter Dutton didn't go, Shakara, 
Anthony Albanese was playing a bit of like, I dare, I challenge you, I double dare you to go to the Gama politics. If you care about First Nations people, you should go. Why would you want? Okay. Why would you want him there? Yeah, to hang out. Be annoying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he didn't go. He described it as a love in, and I just thought it was funny. In Dutton's defense, said uh, Jacinta Nabachimba Price said that Dutton had been to the Gama Festival several times already. Actually, been there, done that. Been there. <laughs> like I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've sat on the ground and met some black people. Next. Yeah. <laughs> but then Gama organizers said they cannot recall Peter Dutton ever attending, and Dutton said that Price had misspoken when she said that. So he's never. He's, oh, he's never lol. <laughs> what was she thinking of? That's quite funny. Uh, he hasn't even been there. Good stuff. Sam, Mike's on the radio. Jeez, he changed his tune pretty quick when he saw the papers. Well, the story everyone was talking about this morning, of course, is uh, Frontline's very graphic coverage of the Serbian embassy riot last night. It was pretty amazing footage, Mike. Yes, it certainly was, Peter. It was uh, it was amazing footage. No, well, congratulations on it. And uh, I tend to agree with what most of the papers are saying this morning, that the, the less collusion there is between the media and the police on these things, the more democratic the society. I, I agree. I mean, we could have notified the police, uh, prevented a one-off incident, but in the end we chose not to, you know, intervene. And uh, I think in the end we've raised... Uh, awareness of the conflict, which uh, in the long run is uh, far more beneficial. I think that's... Good one, Mike. Uh, Where'd you pull that one out from? This morning's editorial. All right. So Jesse Noakes is a writer, a broadcaster and a campaigner. He's also one of the people arrested early last week for a protest outside the Woodside CEO's home in WA as part of the Disrupt Burrup campaign. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Emerald. Hey, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, it's it's very good to have you here. Thanks for getting arrested for the sake of yeah. everyone. We appreciate oh, it. Dude, Thank I, you. I, it. It totally wasn't deliberate, so no worries. You're welcome. <laughs> is that is that your first time or have uh, you been no, arrested no, before? No, I, I get arrested. Not at all. I get arrested accidentally <laughs> okay. all the time. Like, seriously, it's like <laughs> a, a monthly event for me is getting scooped up in some counter-terrorist sting in WA right now. So, yeah, no. Awesome. <laughs> really good. I hate it when yeah. that happens. It's the worst. Yeah. It's so annoying. I know. I know. <laughs> so this is a the, the protest that you were involved in, that you were arrested for, um, was – in in opposition to the borough pub, can you, for us Easterners and just generally for the listeners, give us a quick kind of rundown on what that project is, where it is, why it's so significant and why this, you know, why a whole organisation has sprung up to try to disrupt and stop that project? I sure can because it's been one of my main jobs over the last few years to explain exactly <laughs> that. So. Right. The Burrup Hub is one of the biggest industrial projects in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the largest gas hub in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's going to pump out approximately 6 billion tonnes of CO2 between now and 2070, when if we're still around, the world is obviously going to be a whole lot hotter, a whole lot drier, and a whole lot worse off. What's extraordinary about the Burrup Hub, though, is that not only is it one of the biggest fossil fuel projects in the country, it's also literally right on top of the oldest, largest sacred rock art site in the world. Murujuga is nominated for UNESCO World Heritage Status. There's more than a million, possibly more than two million petroglyphs, ancient rock art dating back 50,000 years in some cases, and it is a very, very sacred site for traditional custodians of Murujuga, um, some of whom I've been working with over the past year or two on a campaign they started called Save Our Songlines, which is mm -hmm. TOs up in the Pilbara. Um, custodians of Murujuga standing up and speaking out to try and stop further industrial expansion on their sacred nuda or country. Um, Woodside is the main company developing industry on the bar. They've been up there since the late 70s. Back in the day, they literally blew up and bulldozed thousands of sacred rock art sites and crushed them up to use as road base for their gas plants. Um, these days, they oh just move them out the way. Yeah, it's um, it's that's, fucking that is, that's fucking Captain Planet eco villain level shit of uh. Mm. No, there's been a lot <laughs> of crushing talk about up ancient art as road to make it a road for your gas project. God damn. Yeah, yeah. There's there's been a lot of talk about Four Corners in the past week or two. The last time Four Corners were up on the bar, they literally got photos of the bulldozers going in and just pushing these sacred sites into the sea. So it's no exaggeration wow. to say that it's um, it's like Jukun Gorge kind of all over again, mm. really. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, like, I feel embarrassed about the level of ignorance that I had about what this project actually is up until I, as a diligent um, podcaster, did some Googling before this yeah. interview. Um, yeah. But even, yeah, just, just looking at, I, I mean, the amount of CO2 that's projected to potentially, uh, you know, emit, be emitted from this project it's bigger than Scarborough, bigger than, you know, a whole lot of other projects. And then in particular, when I went and looked at the Borough Peninsula, I'm like, oh, where is this place? And I, I think we'll put some photos maybe up on our, our Instagram, um, but this place is fucking gorgeous. It's like oh. these stunning red rocks right up in this, you know, crystal clear water uh, on the coast. It is, mm. yeah, uh, and it's just... It's outrageous um, that that site is going to be destroyed and then, yeah, not only just that inherent value of that country um, but that cultural heritage as well. Totally. I was up at this protest march the traditional custodians organised last year and that crystal clear water, you can actually walk out hundreds of metres at low tide and you look back and on one hand you've got like Nyarjali, Deep Gorge, this kind of ancient sacred site with millions of petroglyphs and then literally across the road 200 metres away you've got this massive fuck off fertiliser plant pumping emissions into the air which science shows is degrading the rock art and will kind of erode it completely within a couple of decades. Mm. So it's really this only in WA sort of juxtaposition. They just wouldn't get away with it anywhere else. Yeah, it's fucked. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and I guess yes. So, disrupt Borough Pub has sprung up um, to try to ensure that they don't get away with it. Yeah. Um, a quick rundown, as I understand, and maybe I'm missing some some here. So, let me know if I'm I'm missing. But a highlights reel of the actions that disrupt Borough <laughs> Pub has uh, done in the last year. So, in January, people would surely remember the Woodside logo being spray painted onto that famous colonial painting down on his luck um, that then, you know, most of the descendants of the painter ultimately endorsed. In February, the Woodside building was painted um, and the, the logo again was spray painted on WA Parliament. In April, there was the stink bomb and smoke flares at the Woodside AGM. In May, Violet Coco painted the Woodside logo on the Perth Police Centre um, and there was this disruption of the AFL Indigenous Round game that was sponsored by Woodside, um, oh protester on the field with a big, big flag. Um, and then in June, uh, a protester used a non-toxic stink bomb designed to smell like a gas leak to evacuate <laughs> Woodside headquarters. And That's again, amazing. I didn't realize this was all part of Disrupt Bar Hub because I heard about these protests and particularly that stink bomb one. I remember reading that at work and being like, did you guys see this? This is fucking awesome. This is so smart, like so smart to do Thank something you. that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though, that, that it's not harmful. It's non-toxic, but yeah. it emulates directly. It, it, like it gets so directly to the issue, right, of a toxic yeah. gas leak that is usually a sign that something has industrially gone very, very wrong, that there is an emergency or a crisis that needs to be dealt with, and that's, you know, that's a very clear message. I am curious to know, like, where, you know, where are these ideas coming from? They seem so creative. Oh, that's that's really sweet. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's layers to it, right, and I think part of what we're operating with here is like the West Australian context where doing the standard shit just doesn't cut through. Like it's a total echo Mm. chamber, it's a vortex, it's this kind of silence. No one wants to talk about what Woodside's doing up in the bar. No one wants to talk about how the Mm. WA government is completely complicit in it. No one wants to talk about how the WA police are basically acting as Woodside's private security and we'll get to the final protest in a moment where literally like could not ask for a better illustration of that fact. Um, And so I think kind of... The creative, like this, to be honest, it sort of started as an art project almost, you know, like it, it was, mm-hmm. it was young artists who were getting together. Obviously, the connection with the rock art up on country is something right. that kind of sort of separates this from just any other horrific, horrendous planet destroying fossil fuel project. It's like, yeah, it's that, but also it's like literally destroying the past and our history and our living history as well. So I think it was kind of just a response to that, really. And we've just got a group of really cool, young campaigners who want to try shit and want to do stuff. And it's like, at the end of the day, what have you got to lose? You know, I mean, like freedom and money and phones and laptops and, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah. Sweet. yeah, but apart from um, that. But aside from that, it's like, I don't know, I just think we've got to try new stuff because the old stuff isn't working well enough, yeah. you know. And, I mean, like, no, hats off to Blockade Australia, hats off to Extinction Rebellion, hats off to every single person taking action on this continent to stand up for climate justice and for First Nations justice 
and for justice of every every kind. Um, but I think there is in WA in particular the water we swim in is just Woodside own this state. And so mm. to reveal that for what it is, you've got to kind of sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust, sprinkle a bit of coloured powder in the water to actually kind of make people sit back and go, ah, oh. so you're worried about potentially harmful gas being released in a, in a building, are uh, yeah? Well, you want to talk about like dangerous mm. releases of harmful gases Let's put that back to the bar. And we got a story for you. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I've got some terrible news. The yeah. entire company is releasing gases to cook the entire planet. Oh, oh no. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't want to, don't want to ruin your coffee break. But um, if you're going back into work, <laughs> maybe you should feel a little bit hesitant to want to walk into that building. Maybe it does fucking stink what they're doing up in that boardroom on the 23rd floor. So yeah. I think um, bringing that home is sort of what yeah. this is all about. Absolutely, yeah. So, okay, so now I want to get to this latest Speaking protest. Speaking of bringing it home, yes. <laughs> Speaking of bringing it home, good segue. <laughs> uh, so it, it was, I guess, last week now, um, early last week, there was a protest outside the Woodside CEO's home. Who was involved? What happened? Uh, who was involved? <laughs> well, who has they're, been they're, identified as being involved? <laughs> the, the, and, the, and the operative word there, I'm glad you used it, was outside the Woodside CEO's home. There was no mm. prospect or possibility or intention of going anywhere near the inside of that property. The only people who were inside that property, besides Meg O'Neill and her partner, were at least a dozen counter-terror police who came bursting out and faced off with one young nineteen-year-old woman with a spray can who wanted to send a message about her future. So, like I say, um, there is no better illustration of the way that power works in this state than what happened last Tuesday morning in a rich suburb called City Beach, outside a big blue mansion that looks a bit like the Barbie Playhouse, except the kind of you know the, the classic gender reveal colours are switched around um, <laughs> and. Fortunately, as well as 12 counter cops and one 19-year-old with a spray can, there was also a Four Corners crew because my job is making sure that people like Four Corners turn up to protests like these and get the shots to get the story out. And on this occasion, it was the ABC who got the tip-off. Previously, it's been Channel 7, the West Australian, anyone else. Mm. Um, Four Corners were there. Four Corners got the shots. And I can't wait to see them because... It paints quite a picture, I think. Mm. Um, I was there as well. I was sitting in a stationary car with my seatbelt on when the fucking counter cops wound down the window and said, you're coming with us again. Um, and then as they were driving me away, get this, the first song they had queued up on the sound system in the car playing very, very yes. loud was yes. Every Breath You Take by The Police, um, which is yeah. a bit on the nose. It was also Oof. actually quite funny. Like, wow. Oof. Just, yeah. I mean, they're like, oh, yeah, we can do art too. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> we can send so a message. How are you like this? That's kind of, it's kind of, it kind of is just like a game of cops and robbers. Like it's, on the one hand, it's like the stakes couldn't be higher. On the other, it's just like, it's just. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's just a bunch yeah. of teenagers with some spray cans. And then these mm-hmm. like, these fucking militarized police force playing games with them and taunting yeah. us. It's, it's absurd. And the whole thing is bizarre. Well, that's exactly it, right? So I, so a bunch of teenagers with with spray cans, and this, um, so Matilda Lane Rose, as I understand it, was the the nineteen year old woman that, that you're referring to that you know was there to basically just spray paint something outside the home. Who knows? Um, who who knows? knows? Didn't, didn't get I don't a chance. know. Yeah, could have been. Um, yeah, so she didn't even get to do anything before she was arrested. Okay, right. Um, and she was, as I understand it, one of the leaders of the the school strike for climate movement in yep. in the WA. Um, but uh, according to the the CEO of Woodside, she is an extremist. Uh, I know that. Mm. Yeah, Meg O'Neill, who is this this CEO, came out uh, and you know said that she described the activist group or the, the activists as extremist protesters whose actions quote should be condemned. She said quote This was not a harmless protest. It was designed to threaten me, my partner, and our daughter in our home. Was that was that the aim, like to <laughs> threaten them? No, it, I mean, obviously, obviously it wasn't. There was, I mean, if anyone was intimidated on Tuesday morning last week, like I'd say probably the presence of like, again, not to over the pudding, but like more than a dozen militarised yeah. 
tactical counter terror cops camped out overnight in your home is probably like a more relevant factor if you're feeling a bit frightened than one 19 year old with a spray can out the front like on the street obviously more to the point it has to be um born in in compar in, in comparison to the impact that Woodside's Borough Pub from which Meg O'Neill derives the profits that pay for her mansions and her Maseratis and her lovely, you know, view of the ocean from City Beach. The Barra Pub mm. is directly driving the fires, the floods, the hurricanes that, you know, have done this extraordinary, extraordinary, have created this extraordinary um, catastrophe in Hawaii overnight, for example. Yeah. Like, it, is, it is the emissions from projects like the Barra Pub that yeah. are causing these planet-destroying catastrophes and so i think you have to weigh up a 19 year old outside a mansion with what the borough pub is doing to the only home any of us have got which is planet earth yeah you know? and so just to clarify so is the our understanding of the counterterrorism cops got the tip off somehow or were, were monitoring your communications as a protest organization or somehow knew that this protest was coming and coordinated a response of like 12 counterterrorism police in order to respond to presumably these, you know, these very small number of ordinary people who are going to do something very um, nonviolent and peaceful, like do a spray test. Like how did all that happen? Oh, I wish I knew. And I hope Four Corners can find out because like that's a really right. um, interesting story. Like for me personally, I'd love to know mm. how they knew where I was like four days prior because they know exactly where my car is at all times seemingly. And, you know, I don't know. They've searched. Mm. They've, they've raided my vehicle. They've raided my office multiple times. Who knows what they're leaving behind when they take all my stuff with me with them? Um, but to, I mean, I, I don't. Also, you might have seen a story in the Guardian this morning, Friday morning, yes. about how the day before those same cops had pulled a gun on a twenty-one-year-old. Like, yeah, that's this fucking traumatized. So you want to talk about the, bullying, intimidation? Yeah. Like, so this was the guy involved in the protest at the AFL game, right? Um, yeah. and as I understand, it was just driving his car through City Beach, this suburb, um, and was, yeah, got pulled over by the cops and they just pointed a gun at him. Just, for and no they didn't even tell him they were cops. It was just, it was just yeah. some dude That's who terrifying. pulled in front of him in a, in an unmarked van, jumped out in unmarked clothes and wow. walked towards him holding a gun. It's like, I mean, the, we're, we're talking about, and I, you know, these are, these are young people who I have just like the most, profound respect for they're exceptional exceptional young people they're just they're uni students you know like you said tilda was uh you know a school kid organizing school strike a few years mm. back and for them to put themselves on the line like this and cop not just the police intimidation but also like the press intimidation like they yeah. were just revolting front page headlines the week in the days after this action um yeah. and i just think that like i'm on a very serious level, I'm so proud of these kids because, you know, for a 30-something bloke like me, it, they're the they're young people of the future and they're really fucking, you know, bringing it. And mm. I just um, I hope the cops with their guns aren't enough to, you know, scare all of them off because Hilda, for instance, seems invigor invigorated, empowered, if anything, yeah. which is good. Well, yeah, and it kind of drives home the importance of, like, why we do kind of need to make a point of validating and expressing support for people who take these actions, um, particularly thinking of, yeah, people who like me who are involved in electoral politics and not doing that, um, so that it's made clear that actually, yeah, there are people that agree with what you're doing and back you in all the way, um, yeah. contrary to to what the, you know, what the state and, and the media and obviously Woodside would, would like them to think. Um, I mean, I did, yeah, just, just quickly want to return to that idea of, uh, of targeting individuals and, and their homes and kind of the ethics of that. Cause yeah, it is, it is a little bit messy, but I, I imagine that there would have been a lot of conversations had beforehand as to, yeah, like how do we make this consistent with our ideology, which is a nonviolent ideology? Um, and and our message. Yeah, totally. And I think the, the the one other thing I'd drop in there is the one highlight that was missing from the highlights reel is that the week before this action, Woodside announced that they were suing individual Disrupt Borough Pub campaigners in WA Supreme Court 
for loss of earnings and brand damage Mm -hmm. resulting from the evacuation of their HQ in that very safe, very smart, as you identified, um, fake gas leak the other month. So not only are they threatening literally everyone's home with the Bar Up Hub, they're also actually going after individual climate campaigners and trying to take them for everything they've got. So I think in that context, it's not to say, obviously, it's a quid pro quo or it's kind of, you know, the ends justify the means or any of that. I think clearly going after someone at home, even if it's only outside their home, is an escalation of some description. But like, what else have we got? Yeah. You know, at this point. Like yeah. it's not it's not totally off limits. No, nothing is sacrosanct. Certainly Murajuga's not sacrosanct for Meg O'Neill. Exactly. She's she's happy rolling in with the dozers and, you know, re, you know, tearing down fucking paradise to put up a fertilizer plant as if mm. another one was needed. Mm. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean I I I have kind of been noticing there used to be a bit more, maybe around Stopadani times, a lot of bird dogging, as activists would call it, where you would just go find wherever a politician or whoever would be in a public place and and target them individually there. But at your home does seem like an escalation. But there was this great quote in the, I think it was the Saturday paper newsletter that says O'Neill proclaimed it, sh- you know, that the protest should be condemned by anyone who believes that people should be safe to go about their business at home and at work. One might counter to the American-born CEO who may make up to twelve point five million dollars this year from fossil fuels that climate change is also making people unsafe at home and at work. And it's like there's nowhere to for us to hide from the impacts of, of climate, mm. and particularly when you think about the impacts of you know weather events. Um, like floods and fires, that you are literally pushed out of your home. Um, people T- who, totally. yeah. So, so I think that yes, it is. I I don't know exactly where I land on it on it, but it's certainly not as black and white as oh, they shouldn't have gone to her home because it's her home. You know. Yes, I mean, again, this is this is us constantly coming up against the neoliberal conception of of the world and individual mm. property pri- pro- uh, property rights are sacrosanct. Nothing can intrude on them. Nothing is more important than them. Nothing can supersede that. Even when we have something like the climate crisis, which, as you say, changes literally everything and makes us reconsider our entire association and relationship with each other and with society and with politics. Right? I've just pulled up um, some lines that Tilda actually wrote herself. And, um, and has sent through. And there's just one here that I think basically, you know, I'll, she, she says it better than I have. If you feel my action went too far or was aimed at intimidating Ms. O'Neill in her place of re- residence, do you have the same empathy for the 20 million people around the world who may lose their home over the next 12 months due to fossil fuel driven climate change? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty simple when you exactly. put it like that. Like you can, you can have remorse for an action and still like, yeah, demand greater remorse from the people who are actually doing the real damage here. And yeah, again, it's right. it's not it's not a 19-year-old English literature student with a can of spray paint yeah. out the front of a fucking mansion. Here, here. In, in City Beach. Yeah. It's the, the the woman inside is the one who's doing the real damage and the one who's really making people feel unsafe. Yeah, exactly. So what happened after you were arrested? Um, how long did you did you spend in in the lockup? And I know there were some kind of cooked bail conditions. Can you talk a little bit about about that? Yeah. So I mean, personally, I spent I think about a day and a half in lockup. Um, it was the best night's sleep I'd had in weeks. I can <laughs> honestly say. I, obviously, that's not the case for everyone, but yeah. for me, it was like it was all right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend I had a terrible time. Um, and I'm kind of a bit of a psycho who sort of gets off on this shit to some degree as well, like, you know, the press pack waiting outside. Well, that's why you're the person who should be doing it. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and yeah, I, maybe I, third, third time around I need to actually just bite the bullet and, like, deliberately get arrested for once rather than somehow kind of getting getting swooped, swooped on in these stings. <laughs> um, but, I mean, this comes in the context. So, basically, since this campaign's only been in operation since the start of the year, right? Like, we're talking about a six-month campaign that's kind of gone mm. from zero to 160 real fucking quick. And the police response has, like, escalated at least as swiftly as that. So, from the get-go, it's not been regular cops responding to this. It's been the state security group, which is mm. WA's counter-terror police. They've yeah. had these kind of long-running operations monitoring Disrupt Borough Pub from at least early February, shortly after the, the 
right. uh, gallery action. Okay. Um, over that time, there have been more than a dozen people who've had their homes raided. Um, I've had my office turned over by the cops twice now. I've had my car raided, as I say. I'm on to my third phone. This is my third laptop in three months that I'm talking wow. to you off because what they're doing is not just overcharging people. Like I'm up on an aggravated burglary charge for being a party to failing to evacuate the Woodside AGM and somehow that is that lands me with an ag burg charge. What that also allows I'm no lawyer, cop- but <laughs> Yeah, I well, no, okay. you should like when they when they like, I was I was hundreds of meters away. I never went inside the building on the day, and when they told me, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's aggravated burglary. Can we have your phone and your laptop, please? And you'll never get them back. I was like, oh, okay. Um, well, I guess you're allowed to do that somehow. But I think what they're doing very skillfully and very deliberately is making it very hard for this campaign to communicate. So clearly, this campaign has been quite effective at raising the profile of the Barrett Pub and of communicating a message about what's happening up on Mooradjuga to people, especially on the East Coast who might not have heard of it before. Clearly Woodside and the WA government don't want us to do that. And so what they did on Tuesday, for example, was lock up overnight the two people who drive most of the comms for the campaign, mm. myself and another campaigner called Jared Mazza, which gave Woodside and the WA government two whole days head start to get their story out. But because we were locked up without our phones and our laptops, we couldn't tell anyone that until like three days later, by which time, you know, the Australians sort of decided what the story is yeah. um, already. Yeah. yeah, which is why, yeah. right, they are so upset about the fact that the ABC were there because they clearly, like, are just so transparently threatened by you being able to communicate your message in any way. They want complete control of the narrative. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know that I think that the Premier came out, came out and said that the ABC was morally wrong in its in, in being there or something and accused it of being complicit. Yeah, I mean, what's really worrying, and I just mentioned before we started about the managing director of the ABC rushing out this Friday evening statement like a fucking essay basically saying, oh, well, actually, maybe maybe they had some like sort of intuition or intimation about vaguely what was involved in City Beach before and maybe they had a dream the night before and sort of they turned what? up with some premonition <laughs> that there might be something involved. Like it's, he's just thrown his reporters under the bus basically. And what that is is a very, very explicit and obvious attempt by Woodside and the authorities to pressure the ABC to drop the story basically. Mm. they The last thing in the world they expected and the last thing they want is for Four Corners to run footage of counter-terror cops camped out overnight yeah. at the Woodside CEO's house mm. and charging out to take down a 19-year-old climate campaigner. And the one thing they couldn't control was the fact that the ABC and Four, Four, the, a Four Corners camera crew were there on site filming the whole thing. And so in a month or two's time, the real story of Tuesday morning will come out and it's going to look really, really fucking different to the version that they've managed to kind of like promulgate so far. And that is why every, every us, every weapon in the arsenal has been pointed at the ABC right now to say what you've done is morally indefensible, you're complicit, you're colluding, you're encouraging the protesters. It's like, mate, they got a tip from a source and went to report the story. It's like yeah. journalism 101. It's, yeah. It's the stupidest Jesus shitstorm Christ. I've ever been involved in. I've, I've had a few, but this one really takes the cake because it's just so dumb. Yeah. Well, I guess what were they supposed to do, tell the cops? The cops were yeah. already fucking there. They already knew. <laughs> what were what exactly. they supposed to do? No, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. You're like, I refuse. Yeah, but, but, I refuse to cover yeah, this. Yeah, normally, normally it would be the cops tipping off Channel 7 to come down and, you know, bloody catch us red-handed or whatever, and they're just annoyed that this time it was the other way around. And yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, I was thinking, like, it just immediately reminded me of the whole the drama around, I think it was 2017, when Michaela Kasha's office had tipped off media about that raid of the, the union officers, as if this stuff doesn't happen all the time. And that's the thing, like, it's just... It, it is any any shred of, of power or, or anything. Like they are not willing to cede any ground because they need to completely control the narrative because they're fucking wrong. Um, mm. and, and that's why. <laughs> the narrative is real bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty bad. The reality is a left wing bias. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I feel like it's, I mean, that's part of the entire broad broader response that we've seen to climate protest and, you know, the introduction introduction of anti-protest laws uh, in multiple states. I know that, like, I think WA has introduced new laws clamping down on protest recently, right, like like other states have done. Yeah, to a degree, a little tangentially. So, I mean, Mark McGowan was obviously like this strongman supremo who ruled pretty much with an iron fist and Roger Cook is a very pale 
weak imitation of that. I'm sorry to say he's got the same staff, but like the lines don't sound anything like as convincing coming out of his mouth when he's sort of, you know, talking about t- t- terrorizing the Woodside CEO. It's just like, Roger, you're not, no one's buying it. Yeah. But <laughs> the laws have kind of, they've been a little, like, there's, there's been a couple of tranches of laws that have come in. One of them basically criminalized homelessness in the first CBD and gave police arbitrary powers to kick out anyone they didn't like for six months from within that precinct. Another one, instituted these new laws around protests at ports or points of entry to WA. But the basic um, premise we're operating with here, I think, is that in WA they don't really need to bring in new laws because they already have pretty much untrammeled powers to do whatever they want. They can take people's phones. They can raid people's homes. They can lock people up. They can stop us associating. Like it's kind of as though WA's already crackdown like it's kind of mm. it's it's a default it's a default clampdown yeah. and i think the only thing that's changed this year is that we're kind of pushing against that like invisible membrane a little bit more than maybe has been the case for a while mm-hmm. and mm. everyone's fucking freaking out yeah. like it's yeah. just <laughs> yeah well it's, it's 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 literally just like there's not even that many of us you know we're not talking about like thousands of people on the streets it's yeah. like a couple of no totally totally and that that needs to come and if you know if people can hold their nerve and get over the fact that you know we turned up outside a mansion one morning hopefully that will that will be coming with the greater awareness but like yeah i don't know i don't know it's the the defensiveness of power in in this state and you know in australia in general is kind of revealed in the way they just overreact at this like the slightest the slightest stimulus yeah shows that it's working i think it shows that it's working that uh woodside is trying to like threatening to sue for one of those for loss of social license it's like when that's exactly mm. the uh, what we're trying to do or what you're trying to do is to undermine their their social license so i mean i think that's probably all we have time for in terms of interview but if people do want to become one of the the tens of thousands of, of people on the streets part of this movement or just support you, um, support Disrupt Borough Pub, what's the best thing that people can do? Um, I think right now, because none of us can talk to each other in person, go on the website and there's a couple of events coming up next week. There's a QA and um, early next week kind of explaining exactly what went down on Tuesday morning last week mm-hmm. and how come the cops were having a sleepover at the Woodside CEO's place when we turned up. Um, the following week, there's a public meeting. We've, won- we've run a few of those over the past few weeks, how and why to disrupt Barrett Pub, a bit of an intro to the whole issue, and then kind of an explanation of why direct action is the best response. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you want to chuck us some cash, like, shit, we need it. Um, I can they're imagine to so. <laughs> they us in the Supreme Court after all. So... I think through the website there's a link to the crowdfunder as well. Get on there. And just like just flicks an email, jump on Twitter, chucks a DM, whatever. There's a bunch of ways to get involved. We're still mobilizing, we're still kind of ramping up. And ultimately, in a month or two's time, we're going up to the bar up and we're gonna block the bar up hub for real. We're gonna disrupt it in a material, physical on the ground sense. There is one road in and one road out of the Barrett Peninsula and the largest gas hub in the southern hemisphere is only accessible by a two-lane highway. So if anyone wants to come up to the borough and see the rock art themselves and also shut down the borough pub, um, hit us up. Cool. All right, we'll put that link to the website in the show notes if anyone wants to go and have a look. Um, Thanks again so much, Jesse, for coming on the show and fighting the good fight. Thanks, heaps, Emerald and Tom. Um, Yeah, talk to you soon. Greensland, it's the place to be this coming weekend. We've got the Green Institute con- Conference, but we've also, of course, got the Labor Party National Conference. Woo woo! Um, I don't know how they are going to get anything done because there are so many fucking rallies <laughs> scheduled. <laughs> I don't know. Are there like I just keep hearing about new ones, but the two biggest ones, of course, that I would encourage people if you're in Minjin, Brisbane, to go to. First of all, the Rally for Renters and Public Housing. That is at 11 a.m. at the Convention Center. On the 19th of August, that's the Saturday. Um, we'll put the link in the show notes. There is also, we mentioned last week as part of the Bob Brown Foundation, um, you know, protect the giants rally for forest stuff to try and stop native logging. There's, they're doing a march from Musgrave Park, I believe, 
to the convention center from 9 a.m. meeting at the park. So you can go to that as well. Um, you know, but just I, it looks like it'll be fun. You could just go hang out outside the convention center and see what's what's going on. There's bound to be something. Is Friendly Geordie, like we do live podcasts at the Greens National Conference, is Friendly Geordie doing like the live show at the, the label? Oh, good question. Yeah, good question. Hmm. Guess we'll have to go and find out. <laughs> Buy a ticket. <laughs> Get your tickets now. Yeah. Um, thank you to Jesse Noakes. Thank you to list- to all the listeners, you beautiful people. We appreciate it. Rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. Spread the word. That would mean a lot. Thank you to all the danger dogs who are coming to my show in Edinburgh too. There's been like four of them. It's been awesome. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. They didn't, they didn't come here specifically to see me, but I think uh, they're in the general area and they really like the show, so it's really nice. People you can from overseas, the show on Patreon. listen. Sorry. Sorry? You're, you're telling me people from not Australia are listening Oh, no, these are Australians podcast. who are living overseas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Which understand. still counts. Still counts. Okay, cool. Wow, international. Cool. Hi. You can support the show Hello. on Patreon or follow us at Serious Danger <laughs> AU on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Go to SeriousPager.com. Go to seriouspagerpod.com for all your <laughs> Tom needs. said serious pager dot pager dot. Serious pager. <laughs> Email us at hello at seriouspager.pod.com. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tired. Serious danger Australia. Now, how's my lighting going? It's kind I've of coming in. I didn't have my other little earphone in. Oh. I can hear you so much better now. Now it's like we're together. All right, time for a quick- I can hear- uh, Wait, wait, wait. I can hear your voice now. Segway. Oh, you think My this voice. is going into the edit? <laughs> <laughs> you think we're using this? The show actually edits out everything that I say and it's just you. I thought Good. I've been a part of the show the whole time. <laughs> uh, let's have another vibe check on the voice to Parliament. <laughs> <laughs>